3,200 pounds. That's what my Ferrari weighed in factory form. And trust me, it is far from the heaviest version of this car. If you wanna upset 308 owners, remind them that their car is heavy because they like to believe that their car weighs what Google says that it weighs, but that figure happens to be the early fiberglass European version of the car, and that's also a dry weight. Yeah, make no mistake, 308s are heavy little pigs. Today, we're gonna to find out how much weight we have shaved off of our car, which is part of the reason we swapped in a Honda four-cylinder, and then we're gonna start crossing things off the list so that we can head to the dyno next week. Let's go. Now, before we dive into what the car weighs now, let's rewind all the way back to episode one and talk about what it weighed at the beginning. As I said in the intro, it tipped the scales at 3,200 pounds, or just under 1,500 kilograms for the rest of the world. We have weighed it a couple of times since, most notably halfway through the build when the car was little more than a completely stripped shell, and then more recently when the car was largely finished, although missing a lot of major heavy components. The most recent figure spit out by the scales was 1,966 pounds, but this does include the wooden dolly the car has been perched atop of for most of the last two years. We spent some time and weighed a lot of the components that need to go back on the car, such as the aero package, the wheel and tire package, the electronics, and several other bits and pieces, and we followed that up with a guess of what the car might weigh once it's finished. My total was 2,365 pounds, but I did follow that by saying I don't think there's any way the car could be this light once finished, and here's why. For starters, a lot of the figures that I proposed for parts that need to go back on the car were completely ballparked, such as the wheel package, which we didn't even have at the time. We didn't include things like the louvers behind the headlights or the headlight buckets and towers themselves. We didn't have a finished hood on the car, and we didn't have our Hella headlights or the mounts associated with them, and all sorts of other tidbits too. We didn't include the weight of the coilovers, nor did we include the drive shaft shop axles, which probably weigh about 30 pounds a piece. And then of course there's the interior of the car which we ignored almost entirely. We did account for a passenger seat, but we didn't account for things like door cards, the carpeting, the center console, an instrument cluster, or the rear bulkhead panels that I used to cover up the electronics in the car. The kick plate or the throttle pedal don't add a ton of weight, but everything adds up and it starts to get heavy very quickly. Last but not least, we converted from a carbon engine cover to a solid steel one and this added 40 whole pounds to the total weight of the car. So while 2365 is a nice optimistic number, I'm thinking that 2700, 500 pounds lighter than the original weight, is a nice goal to shoot for. After all, it's important to remember that although weight has been a major focus of this build, it hasn't been the only one. I want a car with all of its glass, a complete interior, something that's comfortable to drive around in on the street when I choose to do so. At least, relatively speaking, I'm looking for something closer to my own personal F40 here, not a dedicated track car. So with all of that said, now's your final chance to leave your guess in the comments of what you think this car actually weighs as it sits right this moment. I wouldn't say that it's done, but it's at least complete. It's full of fluids, it's got fuel in the tank, it's got a complete interior, and it's ready to go. With a 3,200 pound starting weight, I would be thrilled to see 500 pounds drop in total. All right, cars on the scales. Khalil is covering the scale itself, so we don't know what it is. You haven't seen it, right? No, no, no. Okay, so to recap, as long as it's under, well, let's say this. If it's in the 26s, I'll be content. If it's in the 25s, I will be happy. If it starts with the 24, I'll be pretty dang stoked. And if it's lighter than Byron's <laughs> car, which is how much? 2333. 2333, so 2332, which I don't think there's any chance on earth. No way. But fingers crossed, mm, you, know, you never know. I just wanna rub it in his face. I already got it running first, so <laughs> I got all the bragging rights done. But uh, all right, yeah, let's find out, here we go. Yo, 23s? 2377. That's sick. That's way lighter than I thought it would be. Dude, hell yeah. That quarter bounce isn't too bad. And I will say, oh, it's I not. will say, it's pretty close. that's 2377 with the steel engine cover on it. 
That's 40 pounds heavier than the carbon one. So oh, yeah. if I right swap there. it out, I got <laughs> right you. There, I'm yeah. gonna get you. Dude, that's really good. That's incredible. Oh, Let's talk about it. So obviously I am beyond thrilled with 2,377 pounds. That far surpasses any expectation I ever had for this car. I am truly blown away and it is going to be an absolute rocket ship. On top of that, the side to side weight balance is extremely close and with me in the car, it's literally dead nuts. The front and rear balance looks incredible as well. 40% front and 60% rear, that's ideal for a mid-engine car like this. And do keep in mind, we have yet to actually corner balance this thing. This is just fresh out of the box. But I know what some of you guys are thinking. Let's say we did want to get a little bit greedy. We wanted to see just how much weight we could trim off of this car. Well, for starters, we could install a carbon engine cover instead of the steel one that we have now. There are some really high quality ones out there and it's on the to-do list because removing the steel engine cover is a chore. It is without question a two person job. I've also been talking about carbon doors ever since we got started. The doors on the car right now need some body work and if I'm gonna spend the time and money, why not upgrade and save a hundred or so pounds while we're at it? We could also go with a weight optimized wheel if we talk to our friends at Rotoform and behind the wheels, we've got a lot of suspension components that will get lighter in the future. We've got steel uprights and spindles and steel tubular control arms, all of which I'd love to redo and billet later down the line. But as said, that is admittedly being greedy. 2377 is more than good enough. But with the weights out of the way, let's focus on the to-do list so that we can get this car to the dyno as soon as possible. Rather fittingly for an old Ferrari, the first thing on our list is to solve a leak. There is oil spilling from the back of the car, so let's get some parts removed and figure out what on earth we're working with. While we could just reach through the back of the car, we'll save a lot of effort if we just drop the diffuser. It's mounted by two adjustable turnbuckles towards the back end of the car, and then it reuses two mounts that held on the original sway bar towards the front. The whole thing drops in about one minute. Now my hypothesis for where this oil leak is coming from has to do with the design oversight on my part, not a part failure. You see, the oil leaked out of the car only after it was parked and sat for about a day. It hasn't leaked at all while driving and didn't leak a drop during SEMA. Before even diving into this, I had relative confidence that it had something to do with oil draining back from the turbo into the sump tank and overflowing. And a look at the breather port on top of our oil sump tank confirms that is certainly the case. There's no oil on any of the fittings surrounding this part, and the oil on top of the tank confirms that is where it came from. Thankfully, we can easily remedy this problem in the future by just having our PDM leave our oil scavenge pump on for about 10 seconds after the car itself is turned off. But as an added safety so that this can never happen again, we're gonna add some vacuum line to that port, route it up the chassis, and add a loop so that it can never slosh out. At the end of the line, I've added a small filter for overall protection, and I've zip tied it in place for now until I decide exactly how I wanna mount it in the future. Now on the subject of breathers, ports, and hoses, there is one component in the engine bay that I didn't finish for SEMA. Some keen eyes asked why I have an open AN fitting on the valve cover or what the small black thing is over in the corner of the engine bay. And the answer is that this is an unfinished vacuum regulator setup. When I ran out of Dash 8 AN hose just hours before we needed to leave for SEMA, I knew I had to just leave this one undone. Thankfully the car can run without it, but to have a completely finished system, we need to build one final hose and connect the port to the regulator itself. If there had been room for me to turn a 90 out of the valve cover and go completely underneath the intercooler, I would have, but due to spatial constraints, it does cross over the top of it. Other than that though, I think we've got a nice, visually pleasing and unintrusive setup that should give us perfect control over the vacuum in our crankcase. Now let's solve what is certainly the biggest issue we're facing with the Ferrari. And that's the fact that my fuel pressure regulator is mounted to the end of my fuel rail. Coming from the BMW world, this is completely normal, but I've had countless Honda guys tell me this is a huge fire risk. Because it's hanging off the end of an AN fitting, and due to the fact that these K-Series engines vibrate so much, we're going to move it down to the firewall behind the engine. 
As some of you guys know, I had a gasoline fire burn my garage to the ground when I was in college, so I take these kinds of warnings very seriously, and I'm gonna suggest you guys do too. In removing the regulator from the fuel rail, of course there was some residual fuel that spilled out, and some even got on our recently painted black chassis. But I'm happy to say that the steel it did its job, and it wasn't affected at all. It wiped right off, with no markings whatsoever. TurboSmart supplies a bracket with their fuel pressure regulator, so I used it to make some marks and then drilled holes in our rear firewall. Of course, this makes a mess inside of our freshly finished interior, so I needed to clean it up, and this gives me an opportunity to show you some awful video and talk about a new tool. It may not look like it, but this is a shop vac, and I won't say it's the best shop vac, but it definitely has some upsides. You see, it uses an air compressor, or your shop air, in order to operate. Your air hose connects to the bottom like any other air tool, but it uses the Venturi effect to create suction, and it fills the bag hanging off the back side of it. They often come with all sorts of nozzles and extensions, and allow you to reach into some tough places, not to mention the fact that you don't have to get out the extension cord and go plug it in. I had several people come up to me at SEMA and tell me their favorite part of these episodes were the tool suggestions. So once again, I'm adding a link to the description for a cheap version of one of these if you want to add one to your kit. On the topic of tools, I got out the air rivnut gun that I showcased in a previous episode and added some rivnuts to the firewall for our fuel pressure regulator mount. Unfortunately, I forgot to hit record while I was doing it, so the best you get is me bolting it in at the end. For the plumbing side of this, we can reuse the hose that went from the regulator to the return port on the tank, we just need to shorten it. On the other hand, we need to make a new hose to go from the fuel rail to the regulator itself. We're going to do all of this with PTFE fuel line just in case we ever decide to go to an alcohol based fuel in the future, and if you're curious about how to assemble lines like this, I put together an entire episode dedicated to the topic. I'll link it up in the corner. With the hoses tightened down, we can cross the most important thing remaining off the list that keeps us from running on the dyno. As an added plus, it makes the engine bay look that much tidier. I'm happy with the outcome, it looks really good, and we should still have really nice access to adjust the fuel pressure regulator now that it's mounted on the firewall. All that remains is to run a reference line from the regulator to a manifold, but we'll tackle that in the next episode. From here, let's turn our attention to the front of the car because there is a potential safety issue that I want to address. We need to get the car up in the air and remove the wheel so I can show you what exactly is going on. If we turn the wheel, you can get a closer look at the adjuster that joins the inner tie rod to the outer tie rod. And as some of you guys pointed out in a previous episode, it's made of aluminum. While that part doesn't really bother me, what does is the fact that I don't have a ton of thread engagement to the inside of this part. Technically speaking, it's probably enough, but I see no harm in adding more, and while we're at it, we can convert this to a steel part so that we have a higher margin of safety. To get more thread engagement, all we need to do is make it a bit longer. But instead of machining this out of solid steel stock, I bought some threaded tube bungs and a bit of steel tube. I turned the tube down on the lathe to make some equal length parts and then welded it all together, but as you can see here, I was having some serious issues with the TIG torch. I tried cleaning all of my metal, changing my tungsten, changing my gas flow rate, and changing the settings on the welder, but I could not get this stuff to stop sparking. All I can assume is that there might be a tiny bit of zinc content in the tube itself. It doesn't seem like it really affected the welds, but in all, because it was sparking and because this is a part based on safety, I'll probably redo these again very soon. But they should do the trick for now, and they'll be safer than what we had before. Now forgive the talking head segment. If you're looking for more fabrication in this episode, we are done. We were about to get nerdy. We're gonna talk suspension. This segment is for everybody curious about whether or not the suspension on this car is gonna work and all the work that we've put into it. At SEMA, a lot of people asked me what the most difficult part of this build was, expecting the answer to be something about Honda swapping it, but that's not the case. Anybody with some basic fabrication skills could pull this swap off. 
Redesigning all of the suspension, making all the geometry work was a significantly bigger challenge as made evident by how many control arms I have made for this thing. Now, that's not to say anybody couldn't do this. Anybody could, but it took a lot of work. It took a lot of learning, a lot of figuring, and a lot of trial and error. Now, this entire redesign all the suspension endeavor began with the front of the car. We put wide fenders on it, and these wide fenders called for a super low offset wheel in order to fill them. We could have taken advantage of having a big tire by putting a low offset wheel on it, but the problem is we'd have a very messed up scrub radius. The car wouldn't have driven the way that it should. If we're gonna put wide flares on all four corners of the car, why wouldn't we do everything that we could to take advantage of that wide body by increasing our track width, putting wider wheels on it, and improving the geometry, fixing the scrub radius, making improvements across the board? Well, that scrub radius was where we began this journey because I knew I needed to fix it. We couldn't check the scrub radius easily until the car is on the ground and rolling. We can check all the rest of the geometry by articulating it on the car, but knowing whether or not the scrub radius was good is something that I have had to wait until the car is more or less done in order to find out. So, taking a step back, this car was equipped with a manual steering rack from the factory. It still has that factory rack in it. We will upgrade it at some point, but for now, that's what's here. This car also came equipped with like 205s from the factory, very skinny tires. So throwing 275 R comps on the front of it's gonna make it a lot harder to steer unless our changes worked. So now what I'm gonna do is show you guys what it's like to turn the wheel of this manual steering car with 275 R comps on the front. Check it out. Yeah, I'm turning this thing with no effort at full arm's length. I mean, yeah, it requires a little bit of work, but this is insane. It turns so smoothly, so effortlessly. It, I don't think that it could be any easier. And I know that probably doesn't seem like a really big deal, but here's why it is. If I got the scrub radius correct, I feel good that I got the rest of it correct because figuring out the scrub radius was the hardest part of all of it for me. It's the part that I struggled with the most in the way that I designed the suspension and the information that I had to work with. If I got that right, which it's pretty clear that we are really good, we're very close, if not perfect, the rest of it should work too. So I feel really good about getting this thing out on track and that it should drive at least reasonably well once we dial in our spring rates. I know that we're gonna have to make some changes to those spring rates. We're gonna have to go through that big box of springs that H&R sent us because the springs that I put on the car at the moment are a little bit too soft the suspension compresses a little bit too much once I set the car the weight on it down, once I set the weight of the car down on it rather. And I know that once we're really hitting berms on track, once we're really leaning on this thing and applying aerodynamic loads downwards on it, lots of downforce, we're gonna need some more stiffness to it. But that's a crossroad we can, we can get to later. I'm not too worried about it right this second. I wanna get the car out on the street and to start driving it first. Now, on that same note, we do need to align the car. It is eyeballed, completely eyeballed, as mentioned earlier. It's pretty close, obviously. It rolls really well, turns well, all that kind of stuff. But we do need to actually get it on an alignment rack and make a proper alignment. It's going to take a lot of time to get it all right. But we'll do it once. We'll be fine. From there, I will string align the car. Uh, I want to make a setup so that we can do that relatively easily. We'll do an episode about that. I'm excited for it. Overall, it's really coming together. I feel really good about all of it. I hope you guys are enjoying this part of the process. I know that uh, none of the stuff we accomplished today was crazy interesting, but all necessary steps so that we can get this thing to the dyno and then start driving it around. So I'm gonna make some more progress this weekend. If you are in the greater LA area, unless I hit any major snags, the car should be at Radwood this weekend. I will be there with it. Come say hi, come out, check out the car. It's gonna be at the Honda headquarters in Torrance. Should be a very cool event. I'm excited to meet and see some of you guys there. With that said, I've got a lot of work to do. I want to get this car to the dyno next week. So hopefully, hopefully the stars align. We'll get it done. Anyways, that's all I've got. Thank you as always for the support. One last final mention. I'm going to do a Black Friday sale on merchandise. I'll mention it in the next episode as well. Probably 25% off everything I've got left in stock. So if you want something, snag it. Anyways, that's it. I'm done rambling. We're done here. I got work to do. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Thanks as always for the support.